The last two, three hundred years has been a time of obscuring the brilliance of the Vedic civilization, of not recognizing the astronomy and mathematics in the two largest epics on our planet. The Iliad and Odyssey are like small children's books that tuck inside of either one of these epics. Did you know that Emerson and Thoreau read the Bhagavad Gita every day? The American Transcendentalists, so-called. Why were they called American Transcendentalists? Because no one wanted to admit that they were Vedic yoga practitioners studying the knowledge of India. Why? Because the Christians of the time would have hunted them down and persecuted them if they'd known they would do that. It was a cover for saying, we're going beyond your limitations. We know you're uptight. We know you won't allow us to do this, but we're doing it anyway. And they read the Vishnu Purana, the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita in French. Namaste. Welcome to Vedic Vidya. My name is Jeffrey Armstrong, Kavindra Rishi. Vedic Vidya is available exclusively on Chitty Media, English Channel, on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. IST. Our topic tonight is why the culture and language of India can prove that they are over 13,000 years old, or how the sciences of mathematics and astronomy, along with the Vedic texts, can prove the ancient age of India as a culture. Is a conglomerate of historical concepts and trends, but one of its hallmarks, and when I say these things, don't think I'm being critical. I'm just being scientific and scholarly. The hallmark of Western civilization is that its three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, begin civilized life on our planet no more than 6,000 years ago. This is one of the gaps between so-called modern science, which views us as having existed on the planet for a very long time, much, much older than that, leaving us with a question. Why does religion say 6,000 years ago life was created? Why does science reject all of the principles that religion finds so attractive? And the third why I would add to that is why has everyone ignored the fact that the knowledge of India is a vast library with thousands of interesting and important volumes on many sciences? Why have they ignored the fact that science as we know it was borrowed by colonialism from India? And why is it that the civilizations that are split on this subject have so much resistance to hearing where their knowledge came from. How can we prove this? Glad you asked. Because in the Vedic library there are two texts that thus far have been ignored by the entirety of Western civilization and the Abrahamic religions. And those two texts are called, in Sanskrit, itihasa. One translation for that is, as it was at another time in history. You can hear the word. The English word history was a borrowing from itihasa. History is not a word. Itihasa is a word. History is a mispronunciation and misunderstanding of itihasa. Now, why would I say that? Well, because history, as we know it in the West, as I said, either goes back through archaeology and fossils and modern science to dating all kinds of things, 
And religion goes back 6,000 years, parks and says, we're done, that's it, that's the beginning. That's why, I don't know if you know this, but you can't even say the word dinosaur in the household of a Hasidic Jew because it contradicts the 6,000 years ago. Dinosaurs couldn't have existed because God didn't say so. I, I didn't invent all this. It's quite irrational, though, isn't it? I mean, it, it isn't the marriage of rationality or science and the impulses present in religion. And why has no one told you, and why did no one tell me, that there were two books in the Vedic library? How did I make it through university three times without being told this? And that each of those books, one of them, is 100,000 verses long in Sanskrit. And both of them are longer than any other text that exists in any civilization in the world. And they're written in the most perfect, most precise, least inconsistent language, far more precise than Latin or Greek, and certainly any European language, which is Sanskrit. These texts are written in Sanskrit. They're called itihasa because they are stories which supposedly recount the descent of the ultimate and supreme beings down to earth to live inside of human society for a long period of time with detailed information about how they lived, what they did, what the purpose of their visit was. And both the Ramayan, which is the eldest of the two, and the Mahabharat, which is the most recent, 8,000 or so years ago, the other 12,000 or so years ago. How can I say that with any confidence? Well, first, let me remind you of a scholar who's alive now and doing remarkable work in this area. What I know conclusively, I know because of him. His name is Nilesh Oak. So please look up his various works for substantiation of what I'm about to tell you briefly in the 20 minutes we have together. But if you get the gist of it, you'll understand something very important. And that is that beyond history is Itihasa. Still haven't told you the secret. The secret is that in those two texts, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, are hundreds of observations of the sky at the time that those stories were enacted and written down or recorded for historical purposes. And this means that not only does the astronomy in both texts completely contradict the astronomy of the three Abrahamic religions, completely invalidating any of them as the beginning, as having a correct time frame for the beginning. And none of those faith-based religions have any astronomy worth talking about. Nor do they teach mathematics. Nor do they have other sciences in their library. And yet, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata not only are resting on the shoulders of a library of knowledge, which is related, cognate, fills in the blanks, gives information about detailed departments. Not only that, not only does the Vedic library have advanced mathematics, ganita, algorithmic scientific knowledge and logic that spawned the growth of modern technology, that is the direct source of it. But they have astronomy, and no one has told you this. They have astronomical observations of when certain moments in history took place that they're recorded in the Itihasa, in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. And now, with modern telescopes, with modern computers, we can track, we can backtrack the wobbles and circles 
of the planets to the exact moment described in those epics. And those exact moments go back 8, 10, 12, 15,000 years. The reason this was possible is multifold. One is that the Vedic culture of India had a solar lunar, it's called a soli lunar calendar. When you have a solar and lunar calendar, you have coordinates that you can reproduce by backtracking the orbits of those planets until you back up to the positions given at that time in relationship to the stars. Now this requires a little more technical understanding. I'm just going to tell you one technical star-based piece of information. So the pole star that we call Polaris is one of the stars in the sky which appears to be wobbling. It appears to be making a circle in the sky. And according to NASA, according to technology, and according to ancient India, the time frame of that wobble of the pole of the Earth. Now, how do I mean that? Well, imagine the Earth is an apple and you stick a pencil in the top and it's inclined at 23 and a half degrees, give or take, and it's going like this, and the pencil's making a circle in the sky. That's called the wobble of the planet, and it causes something called the precession of the equinox. It means the first day of spring moves backward through the stars over a period of 25,920 years, and it takes exactly that long, which means that each group of stars, each sign of the zodiac, rises in the east on the first day of spring for 2,160 years. Right now, the sign rising on the first day of spring in the western hemisphere is Pisces. It used to be Aries. Before that, and, was, and so forth, Taurus. And before that, it was Gemini. And it goes backward through the zodiac. That wobble is precise, mathematical, observable. It moves at a precessional rate that is precise. 2,160 years per sign of the zodiac, rising with the sun on the first day of spring at the northern latitudes of the planet, measurable year after year in a small incremental change. The Ramayana and Mahabharat record such moments. The Mahabharat has 250 or so useful pieces of astronomical information about what stars were doing what exactly at the time the events described in the book took place. This is unprecedented. This does not exist in any other religion, text, history book, language. Nowhere else on our planet is this present in any way, shape, or form. Not even close. The Greeks didn't know it. They didn't like zero. The Romans didn't like math at all. Nobody does math with Roman numerals. The Hebrews did not know this, nor did they have accurate dates, and neither Judaism nor Christianity nor Islam can tell you the precise historical moment any more accurate than within two or three hundred years that their texts were written down after they were first spoken. So pass a rumor around for two or three hundred years, or pass a story around, an accurate story, and see how much it's changed if the language is changing at the same time. English changes so fast that you can't read Chaucer or Shakespeare if you know English nowadays because the language morphed so much. So why doesn't the Vedic knowledge have the same problem? Glad you asked. Because Sanskrit does not change at all over time. Not its pronunciation, not the meaning of its words, not its grammar, not its poetry, 
This is the thing that no one has been taught. Sanskrit stands alone as a language, and the Vedic library stands alone as a place where the history of our planet and sophisticated civilizations, highly sophisticated civilizations are described. They're the same civilizations that brought about seafaring and encircling the globe before Europe did it at all, both in India and China. They're the same books that taught astronomy, Ganita, mathematics, all of these advanced sciences, medicine, surgery, cataract surgery at 600 BC from the surgical text in the Vedas. An impressive edifice of scientific knowledge with a language that does not vary over time. And then, and this is what I'm trying to get across to you, then, after all of this had been disregarded by the British, ignored by colonization, shoved away conveniently because it contradicted the story of the three Abrahamic religions, it contradicted the story of the hodgepodge of modern science, which had no real interest in ultimate reality and questions, but was just manipulating matter with borrowed knowledge which they were not wont to explain. This time period, the last two, three hundred years, has been a time of obscuring the brilliance of the Vedic civilization, of not recognizing the astronomy and mathematics in the two largest epics on our planet. The Iliad and Odyssey are like small children's books that tuck inside of either one of these epics. And it's time that we understand the magnitude and value and subjects and discussions that are conducted by these libraries of the world, and most notably, the Vedic library. This is what I found being raised in a culture that was refusing to hear these things. They were leaking in a little bit by sincere scholars in Western civilization. Just to give you an example, did you know that Emerson and Thoreau read the Bhagavad Gita every day? The American transcendentalist so-called. Why were they called American transcendentalists? Because no one wanted to admit that they were Vedic yoga practitioners studying the knowledge of India. Why? Because the Christians of the time would have hunted them down and persecuted them if they'd known they would do that. So they, were, they would do that. So they were called Unitarian Christians. It was a cover for saying, we're going beyond your limitations. We know you're uptight. We know you won't allow us to do this, but we're doing it anyway. And they read the Vishnu Purana, the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita in French, which means they were circulating in French. German is based upon Sanskrit. Why have we not been told these things? Why is it not common knowledge in our schools, in our educational institutions? Why do our current textbooks in our schools in America and Europe and everywhere have propaganda against India as if India was primitive and a caste system which it doesn't have and never had? And why does it not mention the procession of the equinoxes and the mathematics that measured them 5,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago? Well, you decide. That's another topic. But it sure does feel like it's embarrassing and awkward to find out that this ancient, brilliant civilization was misnamed, mishandled, robbed, pillaged, denigrated, and is still spoken badly of. And its own citizens now living around the world, bravely trying to have a life post colonial life, still do not know how to speak of and represent their own civilization because it has been so suppressed, because they have been so suppressed. So please find the books of Nilesh Oak and my recent translation of the Bhagavad Gita called The Bhagavad Gita Comes Alive embodies this new clarification of the Vedic Vidya. 
This is the Vedic Renaissance. We are in the midst of a peaceful, intelligent revolution. And it is far more important to remember this knowledge, learn it, and know its implications than to follow any of our billionaires, Mr. Branston, or anyone else into space. That is late adolescent oldsters with the attitude of a teenager having a joyride around our planet while ignoring what's really important, the well-being of everyone living on our planet, one of the great themes of the Vedic knowledge, and the antiquity of the Vedic culture as a remarkable source of enlightened knowledge. Vedic Vidya means shining the light of truth. Tune in to Vedic Vidya on the Chitty Media English channel Sunday nights at 7 p.m. IST. My name is Kavinder Rishi, Jeffrey Armstrong. See you next time. And have a Namas day. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.